All right, so I see that um, people are still coming in, but we're going to get started. In any case, we'll be recording this webinar and you'll be able to access it once, once we're done. So hello, everyone, and welcome to the webinar. Today, we are going to take a tour of some highlights from the summer 2021 edition of Transit's Rider Happiness Benchmark Survey Program. So that name is a mouthful, so you might um, hear me refer it to as RHB going forward. Today, we'll be looking at broad trends in the US and Canada. And if you'd like specific data points for your transit agency, please contact us at partners at transitapp.com and consider subscribing to the RHB survey. So if you're dialing in from one of our partner agencies, we've likely already met. My name is Christine Monjot, and I'm in charge of partner success for Transit's 80 plus partner agencies. And um, I am joined today by my teammates, Etienne Tremblay and Kai Huddard. Um, Etienne has joined Transit's data science team about two years ago um, as a freshly graduated aerospace engineer. And he's been instrumental in helping Transit leverage the power of its data to help our public sector partners. And we're so happy that he decided to put his skills to work for public transit instead of for planes burning jet fuel. And we also have Kai. Um, he works in building new partnerships with agencies of all sizes in the US, Australia, New Zealand, and the UK. And Kai also leads our RHB program here at Transit. So what is RHB? What is this program? Well, it's a subscription service for agencies to receive detailed local survey results um, on key customer satisfaction indicators on a quarterly basis. We officially started the program back in April of 2021, following a successful pilot in November of last year. So the results we're presenting today are from the survey that ran in um, July and August. And this initiative, the RHB program, helps public transit agencies both benchmark for interagency comparison and amass longitudinal data to track their own perfor performance over time. By distributing the survey in the app to our representative sample of writers, spanning hundreds of agencies across North America, Transit's RHB program offers four survey reports per year for an annual subscription. And while only subscribers will have access to all local agency specific data, we'll continue to publish top line national results publicly. And the next RHB survey that we have planned will be released through the app in late October. So agencies who choose to subscribe to the program get a seat on the steering committee. So on this slide, you can see our member agencies who get together before each survey and provide transit with advice and input on how we can tweak each new quarterly version of the RHB. In order to analyze change over time, we we keep questions consistent from survey to survey, while also adding in a number of questions that we can change to address more topical concerns. And if you'll indulge me, I'm gonna to switch to French for a tiny bit to welcome our second member agency from the province of Quebec, where Transit is located as a company. Um, donc j'aimerais souhaiter la bienvenue à la Société de transport de Trois-Rivières qui s'est joint au programme ce trimestre et saluer au passage la Société de transport de l'Outaouais qui est avec nous depuis le début de l'été. Donc, on est très heureux de collaborer avec vous sur ce projet. And I would also like to welcome BC Transit from Victoria, British Columbia, as a new member this quarter. All right, so let's dig in. Um, taking a look at the number of responses we got this past quarter, we saw a slight decline in the overall number of responses from 30,000 to 28,000. About 18,000 of these are from the US and close to 10,000 from Canada. And this decline could be um, because the survey is slightly longer at this time around, which might affect completion rate a little bit. There are 66 agencies where the number of responses have passed the threshold for statistical significance. Given that July and August isn't the busiest time for public transit, we're pretty happy overall with the response level. And just like the app itself, the RHB survey appears in the language that you set on your phone. So in all, we got um, almost 24,000 responses in English, over 3,000 in Spanish, and over 1,500 responses in French. So we're doing things a little differently for the webinar this quarter. Rather than update you on each of the core question categories of the RHB, we've selected findings that stood out on topics like ridership, vaccination and COVID, 
rider satisfaction, and our newly added questions about communication channels and fare collection policy. So if we've timed this well, this should take about 20 minutes, leaving plenty of time for questions. And throughout the presentation, we do hope that you will ask questions. So please use the Q&A function um, of Zoom at the bottom of your screen to send them over and we will be able to answer them at the end. So for now, I will turn it over to Etienne, who's gonna to talk to you about the question that was on all of our minds into late August and early September, ridership recovery. Thank you, Christine. The long awaited return of riders is finally happening slowly but steadily. APTA and the Transit app have partnered to build an online dashboard that tracks demand for public transit on a weekly basis. It shows, among other things, the weekly national ridership in the US. After being flat for about a year, as you can see, US ridership is now on the rise at 57% of its pre COVID levels. 113 million rides were taken in the US just in the last week. That's 40% more than in the spring and 64% more than the same dates last year. Ridership has been increasing by about 1% every week, but it increased 2% last week. I suggest you visit transitapp.com slash apta and play with the data yourself. It can reveal interesting trends. For example, if we break down the ridership by population size, we see that smaller towns and cities have seen a surge in ridership, which is the red line in this graph. The driving factor for that seems to be a couple small cities that have large colleges and universities. And the return to school is increasing ridership for them about to what it was pre-COVID. Return to school is also the return of the morning rush hour. The morning spike is now about as intense as the one in the afternoon, and that wasn't the case a year ago or even just two weeks ago. Compared to last year, we see two times more usage in the morning and 43% more in the afternoon peak. This trend is supported not only by the return to school, but also the return to in-person work and the recovering employment numbers. So that's the current state of things. Respondents to our July survey also have an opinion on what they might be doing in the coming months. And you can see it in this graph. On the left, we, have, we asked them how often they were going to school or work currently. And in the, on the right, you can see how often they expect to do so in October 2021. The responses are grouped into four categories of commuting habits, and they are linked by lines. And the thickness of each line is proportional to the number of respondents that plan to switch between the two groups. So let's look at some of the main ones. We're expecting to lose some full-time commuters. 8% of all respondents are currently commuting five days a week, but expect to reduce their travels. 4% expect to still commute one to four days a week, and another 4% expect to work or study exclusively from home. Thankfully, this is countered by users who are currently not commuting every day, but expect to start doing so. 4% are currently commuting a few days per week, 4% are currently working from home, and 3% are currently not going to work. This would cause a net increase of 12% in the number of full-time commuters, which will have a positive impact on ridership. But that's not all. The number of people who are commuting a few days per week is expected to increase even more. And the biggest shift in habit in this diagram is the 6% of all riders who expect to switch from work from home to commuting one to four days a week. And they are joined by 3% of respondents who are currently on leave, retired, or unemployed. So that drives the net increase of 39% in the number of people who commute one to four days per week. As a whole, this diagram shows us two things. First, riders who are already commuting expect to do so more frequently in the coming months. But also, and perhaps more importantly, 
There are many writers who are currently not commuting, but expect to start doing so. And they will have to adapt to any change that happens to their, to their transit system while they were gone. They will be looking for that info from their agency. At that point, I must say that these, of course, are not numbers from the future. They are based on the respondents' expectations. And we know from previous surveys that these can differ from reality, especially with factors out of our control, like a pandemic. So Christine, I'll let you speak to that. Thanks, Etienne. And obviously, when we said we hoped um, not to ask as many questions about COVID this quarter, well, apparently we weren't knocking on wood hard enough. So let's look um, at vac vaccination rates and masks. Um, Self-reported vaccination rates for transit riders is still higher than the general population, and Canadian vaccination rates have now surpassed the U.S. 72% of respondents say that they are fully vaccinated, up from only 27% in April. And while the percentage of self-reported fully vaccinated riders is fairly constant throughout Canada, we're seeing more variations between cities in the US. And we know that mask mandates are pretty standard throughout North America, but some Western Canadian cities have lifted mask requirements over the summer and some like Edmonton and Saskatoon have reinstated them very recently as cases have started to rise again. Um, Americans might be surprised to hear this, but support for masking is stronger among, among riders in the US than in Canada. Overall, 40% of US, US respondents um, strongly agree that everyone on board was wearing a mask versus 36% in Canada. And most writers said that they would voluntarily wear a mask when writing, and they still think that agencies should require everyone to wear them. And now I will turn it over to Kai to have a look at writer satisfaction. Thank you, Christine. Um, so to start us off, we've got actually some fairly good news on the NPS score front. So for those who don't know, the Net Promoter Score is a widely used metric in the marketing and brand strategy world that asks customers to rate on a 10 point scale their likelihood of recommending a company, or in this case, a transit agency to a friend or family member. Um, as usual, we've seen this before, uh, the agencies that you know, most drastically reduced or changed services the most are punished in the NPS scores. So I'm thinking here of the example of Muni in San Francisco uh, or Edmonton in Alberta, Canada. Uh, so you might've seen this, um, but there was an interesting uh, Twitter exchange about this uh, very uh, graphic from the RHB between Jarrett Walker and uh, David Zipper, the mobility journalist. Uh, so the point was that the NPS score isn't, you know, the be all end all of public transit metrics, especially when the goal for uh, most, if not all agencies is really increasing ridership. And I want to be clear that I think NPS scores provide the most value as like a longitudinal comparison to help agencies track rider satisfaction over time, as opposed to comparison between agencies. So like, you know, is our NPS score higher this quarter than the one before? not, you know, why are our NPS scores uh, not as high as like, you know, Miami-Dade that we see at the top of this chart. I do think, uh, though, as we saw in the spring edition of the RHB with uh, KCATA in Kansas and OCTA in Orange County's investments in real-time information quality, that this uh, metric allows agencies to see the impact of their investments in quality service and improved experience reflected in feedback from riders. Um, also, the degree to which folks uh, feel unsafe has stabilized as vaccination rates have increased. It's something we'll look at in just a second. And agencies, by and large, aren't facing quite the same scale of problem as they were in spring, when in turn, you know, the situation wasn't nearly so bad as in our November pilot survey. So I think overall, that's, you know, the broad, uh, uh, mostly positive takeaway here. In terms of how riders want their agency to improve uh, service, you know, when we ask them the multiple choice question of like, how do you want service to be improved? The answer was a resounding yes. Um, so not surprisingly, you know, uh, uh, riders do want service to be improved in all the ways that agencies would improve them in a world of ideal budgets. Uh, but breaking that down, it, it gets a bit more interesting. So in descending order, of their enthusiasm, riders want more frequency on the busiest routes. Uh, they want new routes in underserved or unserved areas. And they also want more direct routes along major streets. 
What's interesting in, in this question uh, is, is also uh, the last couple aspects of it, potential responses there about removing uh, stops to increase the speed of routes versus adding stops to reduce walking time. As riders, I think many of us understand that moment where you perhaps forego a six or eight block walk to a bus on a rainy night uh, to just sort of take a taxi or Uber instead. But at the same time, you know, we also get frustrated when we're sitting on buses that are stopping at every block or following really indirect routes that slow down our trips. So by presenting this intentionally with language that highlighted that you know, zero sum trade-off, we saw a bit more enthusiasm for adding versus uh, removing stops. You know, meanwhile, a lot of the research out there does point to the benefits of stop consolidation for uh, customer satisfaction and system performance. So in all, I think this highlights the need for agencies to engage with riders in meaningful ways and uh, to make sure that agencies have those means to persuasively communicate service evolution. Uh, communications is another topic that uh, I'll touch on in just a moment. So another positive uh, evolution here speaks to one of the most worrisome highlights, I think, of the spring findings uh, that we presented in the last webinar. Uh, and those were that in terms of COVID-19 risk, riders found public transit uh, more dangerous than attending a small gathering, going to the gym, supermarket, uh, or the office, or even attending a large gathering. Um, so in spring, the comparison between then and the pilot survey in November was really stark. Uh, something we thought might have been related to the population that started riding between last fall and last spring, and, and, and they're having sort of a different assessment of risk than uh, the sort of essential worker population that we had polled in November. So now, uh, compared to spring, we know that 40% you know, more riders are on board overall. And despite this group of returning or new riders, we haven't seen that same kind of perception problem really grow or worsen. Uh, so in the US, for most categories, except for large gatherings, riders found public transit to be about as risky, not riskier than these other activities. In Canada, there was still a bit of a drop off between uh, April and, and these results from late July, early August but not as severe as, uh, as what we had seen you know, from November to April. So it's one of the questions that we're most looking forward to seeing the evolution of into the fall as so much ridership growth, as we know, is, is happening right now or has happened in the past couple of weeks uh, since the data collection period. So now let's take a look at our final highlights from this quarter, uh, which are related to communications channels and to fare collection policy. Um, and just a reminder, I encourage you to submit questions uh, using the Q&A feature in Zoom uh, at the bottom of your screen. We'll make sure we get to them at the end. Uh, so this is here, one of the new questions we've added uh, on the advice of our steering committee, uh, honestly, without which the RHP program would not be uh, what it is. So we asked riders, how do you get information about services from your local transit agency? Obviously, if you're looking at the graphic on the right, you know, the top line result uh, here is heavily biased by our sample population. Um, despite the fact that our user demographics are representative of ridership overall, you know, by definition, everybody who filled out the survey does use the app. Uh, but looking down the chart here, I am struck by how often in our own anecdotal experience, agencies refer to their email blasts and various social media pages as really essential key methods of distributing information. As far as we can tell from our 28,000 responses, that isn't necessarily always the case. Uh, the second uh, important finding here is that public meetings, even virtual, may as well not exist for the vast majority of riders. If something happens in a public meeting, you know, riders are gonna read about it through apps or on your website or local media or not at all. Uh, that's not to say that public meetings you know, don't have an important purpose, but rather that they should be thought of as uh, perhaps, you know, not the most important tool in the public outreach toolbox. So fair policy and fair capping in particular was another great suggestion that came from talking with our steering committee. Uh, we spent quite a bit of time formulating a good survey question uh, about this that was free of industry jargon like fair capping uh, to ask respondents, you know, if they would ride more often, if their pay as you go rides were free once they hit the cost of a monthly pass, which is really you know, the idea that's at the heart of, of fare capping as a concept. So here we see the extent to which uh, fare cost and likelihood to ride 
are linked to income. And it's pretty much a perfect step graph based on self-reported annual household income. By the way, household income is one of the 14 questions that we've asked in our demographic section, which, you know, despite being fully optional, 95% of respondents took the time uh, to fill out. So the fact is, if you're low income, you may not ever have the extra cash lying around to afford a monthly pass. This essentially punishes lower income riders by forcing them to buy more expensive single ride tickets every time they want to ride. You're then forced to you know, limit your rides as much as possible in order to pay for even more important items like food and, and housing. Um, so for every single income category, up to 75,000 uh, per year, more than half of respondents said that fare capping would be very likely to increase their riding frequency. I think that's a really powerful endorsement of one way in which you know, new technologies uh, can make a real difference in making public transit uh, more equitable. And so with that, I will hand it back to you, Christine, uh, to summarize all our findings for this quarter. Thanks, Kai. So we've heard a lot of great insights today from the survey. What does it all mean? Hopefully we can give you a um, few lessons learned. Um, the bottom line is that even though riders are slowly returning, it's important not to, to not just revert to the old ways of doing things. Riders have different needs than before the pandemic, and that's coming through loud and clear in our survey. Agencies should, fingers crossed, um, expect this long-term recovery trend to continue. And in the meantime, we're seeing that riders are increasingly supportive of their agencies. And we can see, see this through the um, NPS score going from minus 12 in November 2020 to minus two in April of 2021 and to one in the summer of 2021. Um, and riders are also giving high marks on COVID responses. 64% are satisfied with their agency's safety measures. But ridership patterns are a bit less predictable than before and are coming back differently than they were pre-pandemic. Um, Laurel Paget Seekins had a nice piece on Transit Center's website recently about how agencies can approach service, service changes um, as they are difficult but increasingly necessary. And as we saw, communications with riders has to be rethought. It's important to reach riders where they are, and that's in the system and on their phones. Public meetings and social media might get a lot of attention and generate noise, but they have limited returns when it comes to actually reaching riders. Um, and lastly, it's not just about service, it's about fares too. So fare capping, for example, is popular among the rider group it's intended to serve. Low-income riders say it would get them to ride more, and that's a big mobility and equity improvement. So we hope that this summary of highlights from our survey has been helpful and can inform your agency's decision-making going forward. So thanks for being with us today. I think we did really good on time, um, and we're seeing some questions coming in, so keep them coming using the Q&A feature. And while we start to compile them, um, a reminder that you can download the North American report at transitapp.com slash happiness. And of course, if you'd like a detailed report for your agency, please consider subscribing to the program. And you can always reach us with questions at partners at transitapp.com. So let's see what we have. All right, so I'm gonna kick it off with um, a couple of things that I had in mind already um, and talk a little bit about methodology. So I'm gonna address this one to Etienne. Can you explain a little bit more how we can assign um, a response from a writer to a specific transit agency? Thank you. Yeah, it's challenging for sure to assign responses to individual agencies, especially in areas where there is a lot of different agencies that overlap, for example, in LA County. But to do that, we asked the respondents, what, the, what was the agency that they wrote the most in a free text field? And we specified that the following questions would refer to that agency specifically. Then sometimes we were unable to classify the answers provided. So we looked at in-app behavior to try and figure out what was the respondent's main agency. Thanks, Etienne. Um, and maybe we can talk a little bit more about um, NPS scores. So Kai, I'm gonna direct that one to you. 
So can you um, tell us why you think that those NPS scores are cons consistently going up? Uh, yeah, absolutely. So uh, I, I think it is interesting to see those, you know, sort of inching upward from quarter to quarter. And um, I don't think we have a full answer to that yet, but I do see obviously there's correlation between increasing ridership and increasing satisfaction scores. So uh, maybe this is a bit of an optimistic interpretation, but hopefully, you know, some folks are actually pleasantly surprised when they do return to uh, transit as their mobility habits are, are sort of, you know, emerging from the pandemic. Um, hopefully also existing riders have noticed the work that their agencies have done during the pandemic and how that work has, you know, shifted from being sort of an emergency response level to, okay, this is sort of a new normal for now and, and, and we're dealing with that in a more sophisticated way. Um, and I think, frankly, there's also been a shift of mood um, you know, not to delve too deep into social psychology, but I do think there's you know, a generally improved uh, outlook today in, in North America as compared to at least the early days uh, of the pandemic. Thanks, Kai. Um, let's see, let's see. Oh, Etienne, you talked um, at the very beginning, you talked a little bit about smaller agencies seeing a big increase in ridership. Can you give us a couple of examples? Yes, yeah, so the, the agencies that saw a biggest, the biggest increase in ridership are generally smaller cities and towns that have a big college and university, and the, the ones at the top of the list are Blacksburg in Virginia, Champaign-Urbana uh, in Illinois, and CATA in State College. Thanks for seeing those um, college kids going back. All right, we, I have a question from um, Ursula and um, they ask, can you talk more about the back to transit data? Specifically, can you dig into people's expectation as they will increase or decrease their transit ridership in the coming months? Um, maybe I'm gonna ask Itzian, since you talked about those charts and Kai, feel free to just jump in. Yeah, so about their expectations, we, we saw that people expect to ride more in the coming months, but we also know from previous surveys that the, their expectations don't always come true. For example, we, we asked the same questions in April. So we were able to compare the expectations from April's respondents to the answers from the July respondents. And we noted that very few people expected to be unemployed when we asked them in April compared to the number that turned out to be unemployed in July. Uh, and same pattern with those about retirement. Also, we have fewer people that expected to be working from home than what actually turned out. And on the other hand, we had slightly fewer five days a week commuters than what people expected in April. So generally, I'd say people, respondents are optimistic that they will be returning to work in person, but some of them lose their job, some of them retire, and some of them are simply working from home and didn't expect to. Interesting, thank you. Um, Kai, maybe I'm gonna go back to um, MPS scores a little bit. So why, why measure MPS? Um, and aren't there other ways to measure if an agency is succeeding? Yeah, and, and I'm, I'm glad also that this was, you know, uh, uh, discussed on, on Twitter by, um, by folks, you know, in our, in our industry. I think that NPS is, is one metric among many. Um, of course, you know, the RHB survey includes a whole bunch of satisfaction questions that are much more specific about uh, various aspects of service. So it's not just about NPS. Um, ultimately, NPS is like a marketing score. It's not a service planning score. Uh, ridership, serving people, getting them on to buses and trains is the ultimate goal. Uh, NPS is a measure of existing uh, rider satisfaction. So it you know, necessarily does play uh, a limited role, but I do think it's, it's still important in today's environment uh, to kind of take the temperature of how much people appreciate and promote uh, the brand and the service itself to their family and friends. Nice. 
Um, maybe we can go back to uh, demographics a little bit because we touched on it very, very briefly, um, but we do um, ask uh, dem demographic uh, questions um, and maybe talk a little bit about the age distribution. So um, are we seeing changes there and what did we ask writers, Kai? Um, yeah, so we asked them a whole bunch of questions about uh, their age, level of education, occupation, household individual income, um, all sorts of things that you would find on a standard kind of national uh, census. And, and as much as possible, we're using language uh, that, you know, is written for those censuses. So folks are hopefully familiar with it. Um, and I think, you know, one thing that we are hearing about outside of just our industry is uh, the retirement of, of baby boomers and that generation sort of leaving the workforce, which would you know, lead us to expect uh, to see a reduction in their numbers among our respondents. So far, that hasn't been true. And I think that has to do with when we started uh, the pilot survey was back in November. Between then and now, you know, a huge uh, a huge majority of those folks have actually gone out and, and gotten vaccinated. So I think in the short term, they continue to see a return of, um, of sort of uh, a late middle age, early elder age uh, folks. And then I think as we go on into future years and have more year over year data, we'll start to be able to see if that uh, kind of retirement flow that's you know, causing all of these uh, shortages of workers throughout the economy if we're going to see that represented as well. So I look forward to checking back in, in future quarters to see how that evolves. Yeah, definitely. All right. So um, I don't want to, you know, our fellow uh, Quebecers here to feel left out. So I want to address, because we compare the US, we compare Canada. So I want to talk a little bit about writers from Quebec specifically. So Etienne, did you notice anything um, different between the responses from the writers from the province of Quebec uh, compared to Canada? Yeah, so the, the biggest difference is how uh, Quebec respondents, how satisfied they are with their agency and how likely they are to recommend it to a friend. So their NPS score is of 20, which compares to Canada's minus two. They, they're a lot more satisfied with their agency. And that also shows an other satisfaction question, the one about the, their agency's safety measures. Quebecers, 76% of Quebecers are satisfied where they're with their agency's safety measures related to COVID-19 compared to only 64% for all of Canada. Wow, kind of a big difference. All right, well, um, that was super interesting. We ran through pretty much all the questions that we've got. Um, as I said before, we will be um, recording this presentation, so you'll be able to access a link once we're done. Um, and I want to thank everyone for taking some time out of their days to hear us out. And as always, if you have more questions, you can always reach us through uh, partners at transitapp.com. So thanks, everyone. Have a great day.